the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, so as you all know, the Holy 50 Days um, is, is, all of it is a celebration of the Holy Resurrection. So as we live through the Holy 50 Days, we, our thoughts and uh, always return to the Resurrection and are kind of engulfed in the Resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that kind of sense, I wanted to share with you a type of resurrection that we see in the Old Testament. It's in two chapters, Judges chapter 6 and 7. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. If you have a chance to read it on your own, I just took a little bit of an excerpt here, and I'm going to try to summarize the whole thing for us. Uh, it starts with uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Where it says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So we see a picture of the Israelites being oppressed because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. They followed false gods. They weren't following the commandments of the Lord. So God allowed for them to be distressed uh, for some time. And he allowed the Midianites, which was a nomadic tribe, to oppress them. So the Midianites would uh, come and uh, rob them. Um, whenever there was a harvest, they would come and take all the harvest. Um, and so the, the Israelites then retreated. They went into dens and caves. And... Um, they were afraid, and it's not just the Midianites that were doing this to them at the same time, but God allowed also the Amalekites to come. So the period of Judges is right before the period of Kings. Uh, basically, you know, God ruled over Israel. He was, you know, their head, but he allowed these judges uh, to be like their leaders. And whenever there was war, a, a judge arose and rallied the people, or if there is a, a a, a problem among the people, then this judge would decide between the people. So during this time, uh, God sent a prophet to the people to remind them of the covenant. Saying, hey, I brought you out of Egypt. I set a covenant with you, and you went astray from this covenant. But you are still my people. I still love you. And as, as long as you return to me, then I will, the covenant is restored. So he sent them this prophet, and then he also sent them a, a kind of a, a redeemer, a savior. And this uh, redeemer was in the, in the picture of Gideon. Uh, Gideon was a simple man, and um, this is what he says of himself. Uh, for, uh, he says, indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So we see Gideon as this humble man who uh, thinks his clan is the weakest, thinks that he is the smallest in his father's house. And we are reminded of like David as how he was the youngest in uh, his father's house and he was just a shepherd boy. And then we are reminded that how David was a type of Christ. So then Gideon is kind of a type of Christ and he is sent to redeem uh, or pull Israel out of this uh, scare time. And when we see the picture of uh, the Israelites hiding in caves and hiding in dens, we kind of feel like maybe it's similar to what we're going through. We are kind of welled up in our homes and staying in our homes and, and isolated in our homes until this period passes. Um, and so this, uh, is, I felt, is very relevant for us uh, in our current times. This humility of Gideon is very wonderful. It expresses the Christian humility that it is in all of us and that we and how we try to be christ-like and it reminds us of, of saint paul's words that says my strength is made perfect in weakness so as gideon thinks of himself as little and weak then the strength of the lord is shown um gideon does not accept this role as the, the the savior of the people very easily and he struggles with it and um uh, the lord then uh kind of um 
puts up with him for a little bit. And I don't know if you remember the story of the fleece, uh, whereas there's this person from the Old Testament that says, uh, Lord, if it is you who is, uh, you know, talking to me and this is your will, you know, when it, when it, there's dew in the morning, let it be just on the fleece and nowhere else on the ground. And then, so the next morning, sure enough, it's like that. So then that person asks the next day, well, please, Lord, be patient with me. The next morning, please let there be dew everywhere else on the ground except on this fleece. And sure enough, it is on, on that, uh, as he says. And that person is Gideon. So Gideon tested God, and God allowed him to, uh, to, to show him these signs before he really took on the responsibility and the role of, that God wanted him to do. Nevertheless, Gideon got there, and he says, okay, Lord, if this is your will, I will do it. So Gideon gathers the people. How many people does he gather? He gathers, gathers 32,000 people. That's a lot of people, a lot of men following this uh, this Gideon um, and it, and it's very uh, good right because Gideon was able to rally that many people but then the Lord says something that's amazing he says Gideon that's too many uh, I, I don't want to give you victory over the people based just on this so uh, that's amazing right that blows my mind like, God, okay, the more people, the better. Yeah, you know, why not? Uh, and, and God gives a very good reason. He says, if victory is established through those many, then Israel will take the credit. They'll say, we did it on our own. Um, but if, if there's victory through very few people, then they will recognize it's me. So he says to Gideon, Gideon, send all those who are afraid. So Gideon says, if anybody's afraid among you, go home. You don't have to come to battle. You don't have to fight. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to even pretend that you're, you're strong. Just go home. How many go home and how many stay? More than a third, uh, more than two thirds, sorry, go home and about a third stay. 22,000 people go home and only 10,000 stay. God wants to work through those who are uh, not afraid those who are strong. So when we are entering a service or entering his field or entering his battle, uh, we, we trust in him. We, so, and this trust takes away any fear or anxiety or distress that we have. He wants to establish his kingdom through no fear, uh, through uh, not th this kind of fear. Of course, we fear the Lord. We have awe for the Lord. We respect the Lord, but we don't fear other things. We don't fear, fear the situation. We don't feel uh, fear uh, worldly thing. So 2,000 sounds like it's a big discount from the number, right? We started with 32, now we're 10. But of course, as uh, you remember the story, even that for God is too many. He wants to make it sure. He wants to make it clear that well, as he, this victory, this resurrection, this uh, life is from him. So what does he do? He gives them a different challenge. He says, go down to the brook and see how the men drink. And those who kneel, um, and uh, then they can go away. But those who go down to the water and lap the water with their tongues like dogs, those are the ones keep for me. There's different meditations of why this and why not that. Um, and some people say, well, for you to kneel down on your knees, it's not a very war-ready position. So, you know, they're not ready for battle. So because they're kind of kneeling all the way down. Some people say, well, when you kneel, if you have a long sword and you're in a sheath next to you, you'll have to take that off. And uh, if you have just a small knife, yes, you can kneel. But if it's a big sword, you can't have that. There's different meditations on that. But we truly don't know why God chose this way. Some people think that, well, lap like a dog, like water like a dog, that's very disrespectful, especially in Israel. You know, you're a human being. You're not going to drink water like a dog. So in a sense, God wanted to use the least desirable of the people, the ones that resemble dogs, to achieve this salvation. There is different meditations and different thoughts. Um, but the ones who 
ultimately are chosen are those ones who lap like dogs. And I think it was St. Augustine that said, you know, in this situation, dogs are not to be um, put down because they are the ones that were chosen, right? So he's saying dogs sometimes will do a lot of good. They will protect the people. They will bark for the people. So uh, in this sense, what, what Israel considered to be something bad, God showed that it could also be healthy. The bottom line is the number. The bottom line is that it's only 300 people. They're going up against thousands and tens of thousands. But God only chose very little, very few of them. And even if you take the analogy, probably the worst of them, the ones that looked like dogs as they lapped the water. Then they go up at right before uh, dawn. In the, in the Bible, it says in the middle watch of the midnight. And they create this scene. When, um, when Monica and I were first married, Abuna Athanasius came and visited us in the house during this holy 50 days. And this is the story he told us. Uh, this, and he uh, told us how this is like the resurrection. This scene, if you will, is the scene of the resurrection. It's like the scene of the resurrection. It's almost daybreak. Uh, it's quiet. The sky is still dark. And, uh, and then there is the way that God told Gideon to do it is that they took three things with them. And some people think this is a symbol of the Trinity. This is an allegorical interpretation. They took uh, a flame, a torch, they took a jar which covered the flame, and then they took a horn. And then at the, uh, at the, the signal, the right signal, they would break the jars. So this would make a loud crash. The, then the light inside the um, uh, the pot would shine forth, the, the torch would shine forth, and then they would also blow the horn and make a loud noise. And then, of course, there is then uh, there were the, the people down down in the valley. They stayed up on the rim uh, around the mountains, and then the people. In the valley, they, when they heard this loud noise and this trumpet and the shot of fire and the light all around them, they were afraid. They scattered. They fought each other. And then the and then the Gideon and his people just went down and chased them and, and finished the fight. And through this, the the, the Israelites were saved. So the, this this scene, breaking light in the middle of the darkness, loud noise and thunder and resurrection of the people of Israel is uh, the, the type of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are some of the similarities that, um, that we will see in, um, uh, in between Gideon and Jesus. Basically, I, I summarized it here just to kind of bring home the idea that what happened with Gideon is a type of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a process, right? So um, Gideon um, went through this process with the Lord. He had to be convinced. He had to get men. And then these men had to be whittled down to just a few. And our Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't go through straight through the resurrection. He had a ministry. He healed. He taught. He had compassion. He, uh, he, he went traveled from place to place. And there was this process that led up to the resurrection. Gideon uh, did his uh, freeing up the people in, in the early morning. Uh, and then the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ obviously was very early Sunday morning as we think. The torches that Gideon used, this is, reflects the great light that shined from our Lord Jesus Christ during the resurrection. We know that there must have been a great light during the resurrection because we, we see it in the shroud, right? The shroud is a negative of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's like sh light shined from him and onto the, um, the material, the linen. And also there is the light that comes out from the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem on Easter every year, showing that this resurrection is light. So the torches in the time of Gideon reflect the light of the resurrection. The trumpets and the pitchers breaking cause a loud noise during the time of Gideon. 
to the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is great rejoicing and thundering and happiness and singing uh, and great noise uh, in heaven and on earth for during the time of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the time of Gideon, the work of Gideon, gave freedom to the Israelites from the hand of Midian and the Amalekite. Uh, and then, of course, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ gave freedom to all of humanity from the bondage of sin. Uh, the resurrection of Gideon gave life to all of Israel. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ gave life to all of humanity. The, um, at the time of Gideon, the Israelites, after Gideon freed them, they no longer had to live in caves and be holed up into places, and they no longer had fear. And also, our resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ during these holy 50s and for the rest of our life uh, dispels all fear and the, we see this in the disciples when the disciples were scattered when the disciples were afraid when they were pulled up in the upper room once they realized that the rest the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ fear flew away it disappeared and then they were able to not fear kings and rulers or other people and they were able to preach and and, and to give the gospel freely to everybody without fear. The time of Gideon, um, God gave victory with a few people, the 300, the lowest of the group. Um, and in the time of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, victory is achieved through one only, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, one, one God. Um, Um, going back to today's gospel, one thing that stood out a lot to me was the reaction of the Jews. So the Lord Jesus Christ was talking and he told his disciples and the people that I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. And simple people accepted that. The disciples took that in and, and put it in their heart. But for the Jews, they murmured among themselves and complained and said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? They were thinking with their uh, natural mind. They were seeing with their natural eyes. But God asks us and expects his people and his disciples to think with their spiritual eye, and to think with, uh, with, with their the, their, their spiritual soul um, and if we do that then we can see that he is truly the man that, that came down from heaven he is the life uh, that came down from heaven um, and when we think of it in a physical sense if we don't have physical food for several days or several weeks the, the physical body is definitely weakened and Likewise, when we don't have the spiritual food, uh, be it prayer, be it scripture, but even being also the Eucharist, then our spiritual um, being weakens a bit. Of course, at this time, we can, we can fill up with prayer, we can fill up with scripture, but we also eventually will need the Eucharist so that, our, uh, that we can have all the spiritual nourishment, all the spiritual food. This is the importance of the, uh, the Eucharist in that it is, gives us life. Jesus Christ himself said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So we long for the bread of life. We long for the Eucharist so that our spiritual life may be strengthened. We have life. We have partaken of the Eucharist, but we have been far away from the Eucharist for a while. So we, our spirits long for it. Our, we want it. We need it. But we are trying to be patient until the time is, is, is right and, and it's fulfilled. But the words of our Lord Jesus Christ make it very clear that this is essential for us. This is life giving. This is what is uh, a, a, a main part in our, in our spiritual life. He says, I am the bread of life. I've come down so that you, you can have life. May God be with us and bless us. Uh
um, and let this time pass in peace and bring us back to his table where we can partake of his holy body and precious blood. And may the holy 50 days be glorious for all of us. And maybe we always hope have hope uh, in his resurrection and glory be to God forever. Amen.